This morning we do come to a very beautiful passage where we end this mini-series. If you don't have a sermon outline, I'd like to ask you if you would to just lift your hand and these guys will question you and ask you how you made it in without getting one and they may take you out, I don't know, but um, no, just lift your hand. Everyone will need one. Um, this has been kind of a special study in our church. The timing of it has been rather amazing. Um, if you look at our look at James, we had no idea that the events in our culture would be going on as we are studying this very passage. So, so beautiful how God does it. We've been looking at the sin or the test of partiality. And um, just uh, notice that title. It's not just a test that James gives us, but this is the first of the tests, uh, three we've looked at so far, but this is the first one where he just comes out and he says, okay, this is a sin. There's no other way around it. Um, in 1995, Marcy and I got married, or excuse me, we got married in 94, but in 95, we were, we were finishing our graduate studies. Um, Marcy also um, was in the master's program, master's of divinity program at, at uh, uh, the seminary in Texas, Southwestern Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas. That's where we met. We fell in love. And um, I walked into the library one day, tried to talk to her. She ignored me, told me to go away, leave the guy alone that I was trying to talk to. Uh, they were studying. She kept telling me to get lost. And I left going, wow, who is that? Um, in fact, I said to her, I said, where are you from? She said, China. Now, please, leave us alone. She's, those of you know, she's Brazilian. So I, I was just kind of amazed at that behavior. But anyways, uh, by God's grace... I did get to know her, and we came, we got, we got married right here at this place in December, and uh, come in June, we were graduating uh, with our master's degrees and, and headed out to do what the Lord had called us to do. Well, in that process, like any graduate coming along, you prepare a resume, you start talking to churches, and you start talking about ministries, about where you would go serve. I was only 25 years old, um, had never been a pastor before, you can kind of see um, that rather young looking guy that's there, the resume is out there talking to about 20 different churches. And in the process of it, um, I had a very interesting thing happen. Was talking and praying with various churches about where does God want us to be? That was the big question. Fasting over the issue. Um, and many of those churches were, were looking for either staff pastors to serve in some role, especially as a new graduate, that would be the case. And uh, I, I was talking a lot to these various churches in various states, really around the, um, around the nation. In fact, even around the world, there was a church in American Samoa that was looking for a young, um, a young uh, pastor. And uh, so we could have wound up in American Samoa. I, some of you are going, where is that? Um, uh, just get out your map and look at it. Uh, wouldn't have been bad. Um, but as we prayed about it, um, we had more and more serious conversations, either on the phone or in person, with some of these churches. I received an interesting call one night with a, a pastor that I had talked to about being on staff at his church in, a, in an auxiliary role. And it was, he called me and he said, I, I need to talk to you about something. Uh, we've talked a little bit, been interested, but um, as I've met with other people in the life of the church, as I've met with a couple of committees on this position and so forth, he said something came up and um, he said, I'm really sorry that I have to bring this up. But he said, on your resume, we notice that your wife is listed on the resume. And he said, I'm so embarrassed to ask this, but he said, is she um, perhaps Latino? Is she perhaps Hispanic? Her middle name is Alves. And I said, yes, I love Brazilians so much I married one. <laughs> and he said, I'm just embarrassed to tell you this, but um, we're going to have to remove your name. He said, that won't work here. I said, okay, good to know, good to know. Had never met Marcy, had never gotten to hear her heart, 
had never even seen a picture of her, but just saw her middle name. And a result of her middle name, embarrassingly said, this would never work here. That was in 1995, 22 years ago. I can say that God spared us from that congregation. Um, <laughs> but if you read the book of James, and if you look at our settings around us, we see that the word of God is alive and living, and it cuts down deep into our hearts and through all ages, through all generations, through all decades and centuries and millennia. God's word stands as the truth, dealing with the problems of the human heart. I want you to see here with me in James chapter 2. Um, I just affectionately read this, this passage in the box um, for perhaps the sixth time with you. This is part four, though on Wednesday nights we have also studied this. So we've read it as a church family a few times. I want us to read it again, and this will be our final time of reading it during this study of James. And uh, we come to verses 12 and 13 at the close of the passage. And uh, we, we come to see how James pulls together this test. Let's pray together before we read. Holy Spirit, we are going to turn to your living word now, and we ask God that you would speak to each one of our hearts. Lord, would you come and that we invite you to come and either affirm or convict in our hearts as we stand before you this morning. Lord, I pray for us as individuals. Lord, you know the hidden person of the heart. You, you come to us pursuing the hidden person of the heart. But Lord, I also pray as a collective body, Sheridan Hills, that we would come, Lord, to you and be like you. Lord, that we would hear your word, remember your law, and pursue it through the one who fulfills it and gives us the power to be like you. And so, Lord, I pray that you would come and you'd convict us. I pray that you'd speak to us. I pray that you would change us from the inside out. In Jesus' name, amen. James chapter 2, verse 1. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place while you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or sit down at my feet, you remember what we said, or sit down beside my footstool. Have you not, verse 4, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts. Verse 5, listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich ones, the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court, are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? So he brings up this illustration of rich and poor, the differences on the external, the outside. God is not against rich people, as we have said. No, not, not at all. We went through a long list given to us, even by name very often, from the book of Acts and other letters of the Bible that were wealthy people who had come to faith. But we recognize that by and large, those who respond to God the most are not the rich in this life, but the poor because the rich are tempted to look at what they have. They are tempted to rely upon what they own. They are tempted to make their own way in this life. Whereas the poor recognize that there is desperation and the need for relief and help. And so James combats this 
evil tendency in our hearts, not just about rich and poor, but to look at anything on the outside versus the hidden person of the heart on the inside, the value of every mortal being that really has an immortal soul. And so we come to this passage where James says, this is evil and this is ugly. And in fact, it's one of the tests that you can measure in your own life on whether or not you even know God. Look at verse 8. If you really fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Last week we saw verse 10 and 11. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for what? All of it. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but you do murder, you have become a what? Transgressor of the law. Look at verse 12. So speak and so act as those who are judged under the law of liberty. Verse 13, for judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. If you mer missed the first three messages, you can see them on SheridanHills.org or on YouTube. All of our sermons are available on that. I just want to make that clear because as we close this mini-series within the series of James, I know that some of you are new to us and some of you aren't, aren't sure of all of the background that is there. You can go and you can look at all of those messages. In fact, on many of them, the notes are even there where you can download them. But number two, notice this. This is what? What, what letter is this written to the early church? This is the first letter written to the early church. Of all the letters that would be distributed to the early church, here's the first one written from James. And it's Pastor James. He's writing to us from where? From Jerusalem. So he's the pastor in Jerusalem, and he's writing to all of these churches that have been spread around. Number four, it is written to Jewish Christians. Now, many of the other letters in the New Testament are written to Jewish and Gentile Christians, non-Jews. But this one is interesting in that it's written to Jews who have come out of the law to faith in Jesus Christ, or at least some of them have. Notice this next part, number five. There are already hints of cultural Christianity beginning to appear in the early church. Now, this is rather new. This isn't typically just review, but it really helps us understand this. So already it's possible to go to a church where it's, it's got its own culture kind of going, and people are drawn to that culture. They kind of like that group of people. They don't understand it all, but maybe they're in Carthage, or maybe they're up in somewhere in modern-day Turkey, or maybe they're over in Greece, or maybe even in Rome, and there, there's these Jewish synagogues that are there placed all around the civilized world, and the gospel has come to those Jewish synagogues. Not everybody is necessarily a, a Jewish person anymore, but many of them are saying, no, the Messiah has come, and it was Jesus of Nazareth. So they're, they're responding. And there's quite a movement at this point because this was written around 43 AD. This is written about 13, 14, 15 years after Jesus had ascended to the Father. So the church has been going for over a decade at this point. There's some movement going on. There's more identity of these different groups of people, and some people are being drawn to that. But some, though they're being drawn to that, they are unconverted fill that in. You see, the church, James is concerned about unconverted people being in the church, people who have not yet come to faith in Jesus Christ. There's also concern that there's behavior that is inconsistent with true Christianity. That's a very important part of cultural Christianity. There's, in cultural Christian churches, there's, there's many who are there that really don't know the gospel. They're there because of the culture. They're not there because of Christ. And there's behavior that is there that doesn't represent Christ in his teachings. 
And the third one that is there, the church is infiltrated by values and thinking of the world. Not thinking as God says to think, not valuing the things that God says important, but the church is, is perhaps even at this early state letting the values of the world to come in, like, it's better to be rich than poor, and, and you can show partiality, and you can give partiality to the people who seem to have it all versus the poor man who has no standing. And so these things are part of the cultural Christianity that is going to appear. Could we not say that those are very great dangers for the church in America right now? In the churches in Europe, and the churches in Africa right now? In fact, we know that 300 years after this in North Africa, there were many in the North African church that did not know Christ. They were drawn to, by this point, the big buildings and the beautiful structures and, and all that is there and the movement. And it was even good for business to be involved in church. You see, in the 1940s and 50s and uh, the early 60s, that, that was very much the case here in America, that it was good for business to be involved with a, a good, shiny church. But here we see that no, the concern is of unconverted people being in the church, behavior that's inconsistent, values of the world. So in the midst of all of this, look at number six, James blows the lid off the seemingly little sin of partiality. He comes and he exposes it. He comes and says, this is unacceptable. This is sin. When you look on the outside and you judge others based upon their wealth or based upon their accent or based upon their heritage or based upon their skin color or based upon their education or based upon whatever it may be, you are sinning against God. James blows the lid off. Number eight, we see that if you have broken one law, you have broken them all. Did we not see that last week? You see, part of that in verse nine, or number nine is a major deception of Satan is, come on, you're really not that bad. Even for the early Jews. You remember we said that the, the, the rabbis had exalted this idea among the people that, oh yes, we do have all of these laws, but if you just keep one law really, really well, it will overshadow all of the other laws that you have broken. You see, that's where this text is coming from. We see that James is combating that heresy. He is combating that heresy false doctrine. He is combating that sense of human justice versus the justice of God. Because we're tempted to think, well, wait a minute. If I've broken all of the laws, then there's no hope. And God says, exactly. There's no hope without me. God wants us to look and to see and, and fill these in that number 10 says, while not all sins are equally ugly, the least of sins, the smallest of sins, will shatter God's law. There's no doubt that some sins are more ugly than others. There's no doubt that some sins are going to affect more people than others. But James is saying to us, one sin breaks all of God's law. It, I mean, look with me in verse 11. Look at verse 11 in the box. He says, for he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. You see, James brings up the two worst laws that you can, the two worst sins that you can commit, perhaps, against others. That you murder them. And, and, and not the worst, but they're, they're certainly bad ones. And of the, of the Ten Commandments, they are certainly the more grievous laws that you can break, the more grievous violation against your brother. 
I mean, to kill him, that's a pretty big violation. Or if with your spouse, when you go and you go after somebody else, that's a pretty big violation. And, and what James is saying is, you think your partiality is small, but it's like murder, and it's like adultery. If you've broken one sin, you've broken them all. So in verse 11, or number 11, we see that there's no grace in the law. There is no grace in the law. If you've broken one, you've broken them all, and in that breaking, you're in great trouble. There's none whatsoever. We need rescue. Now, don't turn your sheet over just yet. We need rescue. Now, last week we saw this. Last week we saw the law of God in a visual way that as we went forward in this, we said, well, what about my one little sin? And we go out, and with our one little sin, notice, we shatter. We shatter God's law. We break all of them, and it all comes down around us. We find ourselves in the, in the place of being totally broken against the heart and the law of God. Would you read the passage that's on the scripture that's there in front of me? Let's read it out loud. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. That was the point from last Sunday. That your partiality, it's a big deal to God. Just like your, your little bit of hidden porn, that's a big deal to God. Your, your little white lies, that's a big deal to God. There's no white lies. You name your pet sin, maybe that only you know about. You've broken all the law of God. And there is no hope apart from that law being fulfilled. We have the glass. No, 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 no need. <laughs> I'm surprised a bunch of people didn't show up with helmets and safety glasses this morning. No, no, no worry, Miss Faye. Nobody's, nobody's going to hurt you. This one sin is a sin for which I became culpable of all the law of God. What does this show us about God? You see, it's not stated in the text, but if you look at all of the, the logical conclusion of the whole scripture is, it is one more statement that God is a so supremely and ultimately holy God, he accepts not one sin. There is no grace in the law. He, expect, he accepts no sin. I, I want you to see this. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The glass is down on the floor. We've broken it all. But the truth of the gospel is this. If anyone is in Christ, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You see, that's the picture of baptism. That is the picture of when, when we lay down in the, in the grave with Christ of our belief that we, we recognize that I am dead in my sin and I can only be made alive in Christ. That is the picture that he raises us up and he makes us new. That won't someday happen for the Christian. That happens at the moment that you surrender in faith to Christ, that you believe upon him and recognize that he has paved the way. And if you trust in that, he will make you new. 
Now, James is all about us recognizing the big picture of faith in Christ. The fact that we have broken the law. In fact, this morning, um, in the four years, there are some of these uh, vases or some of these things that are here. And there's some little envelopes. Some of them have already been loaded with a piece of glass, but I want to encourage you to take one of these home and to take that glass out and put it somewhere where you see it on a regular basis. Let it be a reminder to you that you desperately need Christ. As a Christian, that you remember, listen, I've broken the whole law. I, I need not only total forgiveness, but I need total healing. And that's what the gospel says that God does. Now, if that has happened in your life, we're called to God's way. We're called to live according to God's values. We're called not to continue to skate with the world, but we're called to stand in Christ, to stand in faith. We're called to be in Him. I'm no longer in the world. I'm no longer in my sin. I'm no longer... All of my identity is now in Him. That's the only thing that really matters. We've just sung about it. I can't brag about gold and clothes and all of the things that are here. We've just sung the hymn. Uh, my worth is in Christ. Yes. That even in my sin, His love saw me needing mercy and that He came to rescue. See, friends, this is what James is getting at. And James is saying, if you've been redeemed, if you've been saved... You're going to live like it. You're going to act like it. It's going to change the way that you obey. And so James and his final statements are right there. Look at verse 12. And I'd like to ask you, if you would, to read 12 and 13 out loud together. If you need to look at the bottom of your page um, or the bottom of the box, you can do that, or the screen. Let's read it out loud. So here's his final statement after he said, look, this is sin. The, here's the example so you understand. And he says, you've broken all of it. You, 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 you have to come to God and live in faith in God. And if you, if you have come to liberty in Christ, this is what you're called to do. Look at verse 12 and 13. Let's read it. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who show no mercy, mercy triumphs over judgment. Okay, very quickly, and most of this you'll have to unpack when you get home, but this is the no-nonsense logic of trusting and obeying God. We said that James shoots straight to the heart. He doesn't mess around with flowery language. He gives it to you straight, and here we see it. He's saying, so speak, so in the box on the top of your page, circle that in verse 12, speak. And then circle the next one, act. He's saying, let your tongue, let the way you talk and the way you act be as those who are going to be judged under the law of liberty. Now, what, what, is, he, what is he saying here? There's two things. And, and I want you to see this on your outline. Pastor James is indicating one of two things will be the case. Number one is this. Either you will speak and act as true Christians holding the faith in Christ Jesus when, he, when it comes to how you treat others, or the one down at the bottom is, or you will speak and act as phony Christians. So you're either going to act like a true Christian or you're going to act like a phony Christian because that's what he's dealing with. That's what James is dealing with in the church. And part of this is, is that some of you are true Christians. Well done. It's shown in the way you live. It's shown in your love. It's shown in your mercy. And some of you act like this situation that I'm calling to account, he says, and he says it simply reveals that you don't know Christ. 
And so what do you do when you find that, wow, that's talking about me, that's talking about the hatred in my heart, or that's talking about these things that, that I don't trust God in trials, or that I don't receive his word, or I blame everything on God, chapter one. Or I find myself judging people on the outside, which is such a not God thing to do. If you find yourself in those circumstances, what do you do? You repent of your sin. You recognize your need for the, the God of love and the God of life. And you serve him. You see, that top one, either you will speak and act as a true Christian, holding the faith, that's what verse 1 is talking about, holding the faith of Christ Jesus and how you treat others. You see, this is consistent with your professed allegiance to Christ. If you're, if you're, if you're acting like a true Christian, then what you say with your mouth matches what you do with your life. Look at the next one. This is consistent with his heart and commands. Okay, you're revealing that you're with God by the way you act in your life. You're revealing that you're not a phony Christian. You're not just a hypocrite Christian. Now, let me be clear here, that, that, and I don't want to take the power out of this because some of you do not know Christ, and, and you, you need to really think about this. Cultural Christianity has been your deal not coming in repentance to the Savior, in staying in repentance to the Savior. But I, I want to say, yes, it's possible for Christians to struggle with things and to deal with things. And, you know, part of the test is what we're about to see even on the next pages. So what do you do with that? And that's part of what this supper is about. That's part of what Holy Communion is about, that we remember that Christ died for these things. These things very often that we think are so little that reveal that we need his grace. Look at the third dash there. This will reveal that the law has been fulfilled on your behalf. You see, Christ came to fulfill the law. And that's why I believe that James writes there the law of liberty not the law of sin and death. The law, you may want to make this as a note out there to the side, the law of liberty is the fulfilled law in the Messiah. This is the fulfilled law of Christ. This is Christ fulfilling the law. The, the law can only condemn you. It, it cannot save you in itself. Why? Because of this one right here. You've broken it all. But when the Messiah comes, God himself comes and says, trust in me that you may know what salvation is. The law is fulfilled. Now, I, I want us to read Romans 8, 1 through 8. Um, this is so important. And, and this, is, this is for Christians to understand what Christ has done for us. And let me remind you, and just put out there to the side, Romans 7. Romans 7 is the picture of the struggling Christian. Romans 7, just put a note out there to the side, the, our struggle with sin. Because, because no Christian doesn't struggle with sin. But look at Romans 8. He's talking about this glorious thing that God has done. Look at verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has, underline it, set you free, where? In Christ. Underline that whole phrase. Set you free in Christ. This is the fulfilled law. This is why some will say, yes, you're living out your salvation. Has set you free in Christ from the law of what? sin and death. Verse 3, for God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. You've blown it. The law can't save you. You can't keep it all. 
by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to what? The Spirit. So, so he's saying if you've accepted Christ, the, he has come and he's fulfilled the law on your behalf and you're not walking like the world. You're not walking in this way. You're walking by the power of the Spirit living as God desires for you to live, has designed for you to live. Verse 5 says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Verse 6, for to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. This is the importance, number one, of being converted to Christ, to his spirit. Number two, this is the importance of staying close and staying filled, staying walking with him. That you don't become a big flesh ball running around living in your carnality, living in your bad attitude, living in your bad morals, living in your bad actions, living in your, your selfishness. You see, those are all the things of the flesh. Instead, you live with the mind of Christ. You cannot do that apart from this word. That is why Christians must stay in the Bible. That is why we must read the Bible. That's why you need to go home. And this week, every day, you need to spend time reading God's word. You need to feast on his word. You need to learn his word over the decades of your life. You need to become a greater and greater student of what he has said. Because you see, it is the word that will revive your hard heart. It is the word, it is his truth. When you see what all God has done and when you see what all God wants, listen to this, when you see what all God promises to you, to help you, that's how bad attitudes get overcome. That's how bad habits get broken. Jesus responded to temptation and to these things that Satan threw, him, threw at him with the word of God. Why would you think that you can do any different? Some of you are saying, I just don't get this Christian thing. You know, it seemed good for a while, but I'm getting kind of tired, and I, I can't really do this and everything else. Well, my question is, are you staying in his word? Don't blame it on God. James says that's a bad idea in James 1. Don't blame it on Christianity because you're not living it. Stay in his word. There's just a few disciplines that if you would do, then you'll experience victory in your life. One of those is to keep coming to worship. The first one I'm going to say to you is if you just keep coming to worship, you're going to be protected from running away from God. Your friends here are going to say, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Come here. Are you doing okay? What's going on? Let me help you. Let me pray with you. Let's, let's stay together. That's why you need to have good friends at church. I mean, this, this needs to be a, a part of your huge Christian obedience support system. But number two, you, you keep coming to church. Number two, you stay in his word, the preaching of the word, like this. But also, when you're driving in your car, man, we've got so much good teaching. Don't listen to bad teaching, get good teaching. But there's teaching available on the, on the internet and on the radio. And, and you stay in his word, and even if you just take one chapter a day and read one chapter over and over again for a month, by the end of that month, you'll have practically memorized it, and I'll guarantee you that God will be speaking to you in keeping your heart warm toward him. But if you leave this book closed, and you leave it on the coffee table or on the nightstand, or hidden somewhere in your house where you don't even know where it is, how can you expect for God to keep your heart toward him when you're not listening to him. The world is winning. The commercials, the pop-ups, all of that's winning. Basically, all, just everybody else in their views, we must feast 
on the word of God. Okay, so either one, you're true Christians holding the faith in how you treat others, or two, James is saying in those passages, or you will speak and act, bottom of the page, speak and act as phony Christians, revealing your judgment to come due to your treatment to others, because this is against the heart of God. You see, unconfessed sin and an unsurrendered sin to Christ is judged with a judgment where you pay the penalty. And that penalty is death, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord, and the the proof is in the pudding. So notice here with me, your actions are inconsistent with your professed faith. You're living inconsistently. Your actions reveal that your, oh, this is so important, your heart has not changed. Your heart hasn't been converted to Christ. Your actions reveal that you do not have the mercy of God in your heart toward others who are not of your preference. Oh, it's easy to love those who you like. What about those whom you don't like? That's ones that are not like you. You see, the love of God, he loved us who had said no to him, who had rejected him, who were not like him. And yet he loved us. Flip the sheet. This is the big message of James. Do you know God? And if you do know God, are you living for God? This is the big message of these verses concerning partiality. There's a few important closing notes on partiality that we need to recognize and that we need to say. Number one, the principles of impartiality apply in all directions. No direction is exempt. Now, it's not only about the rich to the poor that need to be impartial, but it's about the poor to the rich that need to be impartial. You see, it, the principle stands throughout Scripture, God looks on the heart, you need to look on the heart. You need to see every person around you. Regardless of how you come to this, you honor and respect, and you do not deal with partiality based upon the externals of people's lives. This not only is about the oppressor to the oppressed, but this is about the oppressed to the oppressor. Because you see, listen to this, there is great power when someone who's part of the oppressing group, whether it's the rich, that they come into the poor and they honor the poor men themselves. You see, people go, well, wait a minute, that's not normal. But the, but the rich man who loves Jesus, the rich man who comes in and, and he honors the poor man, and he, and, he, and he just does that, that's a, that's a beautiful thing. Or it's the church that looks at the rich man and welcomes him in and says, great, you come sit here, that's great. And that same church goes like this when they see the poor man come in. They look at him and they go, hey, we're glad you're here. You come sit in this great place right next to the rich guy. Because we don't care about the outside. That's what James is saying. Some of you bought C.S. Lewis's book. It's, it's, a combina it, or it's a compilation of some sermons by him. The first one in there, The Weight of Glory, the first one in there is such a great message. And, and he just challenges all the way through to be looking at how God looks upon people. And if you will do that, you will see every person you see not as a mortal who's just going to pass away, but as an immortal soul that deserves your respect. And even the ones who persecute you, even the ones who hate you, even the ones who come after you, as Jesus did, 
on the cross of Calvary after we had nailed him to the tree and lifted him up. He loved his persecutors. And he said, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. You see, Jesus isn't calling us to do anything about this that he hasn't done. That's why we're called to be like Jesus. Now, we can't do this in our own strength. We have to do it in his strength. And let me tell you that as Christians act like true Christians, whether it is the poor man or the rich man, whether it is the white man or the brown man or the black man or the yellow man, and I don't think we're supposed to say yellow, but or the, 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 the Asian background, what, what, what Whatever it is, if those things begin to come way down in your priorities and you begin to see every human being as having a heart before God regardless of these external things, then you begin to see the way of God. You know, we have a massive problem with racism in our country. It's not, it's not a little thing. It's a real thing. And there has been a, a massive problem with unjust treatment of African Americans specifically. There is no doubt about that. It's been a systemic problem within the police, some sectors of the police. And, you know, it's really unfortunate that 99 or 999 wonderful, law-abiding, honoring police officers are, are poisoned by the flagrant disregard and racism of a few. Even so, do we listen to this and do we pay attention to it and do we seek to fix that? We better. We should. But do we let this continue to divide and divide and divide? Oh, Satan loves that. He loves to divide human beings. He loves to cause more hatred and more anger and more resentment. You're ruining my life in any direction, any direction. Friends, if we're true Christians, we're going to let the gospel rise above every bit of this. Amen? That's what, that's what we have to do, is recognize that the gospel calls us far beyond all of this. I am, I'm blessed by the fact that the Hollywood police chief called us as pastors and said, would you please pray for me? Would you please pray for the Hollywood police force? Would you come and would you help us? I, I want our police force to do it right. I want us to be trained right. I want us to love right. I want us to deal with these things. But yes, the African American community has, everybody that looks at the sociology of the whole situation says the absent fathers that typically have been uh, on the whole there, has, this has created a massive problem that does lend itself to greater and greater crime. So there's far more interactions because of this. That is all true. So what do Christians do? Christians seek to live the gospel and to proclaim the truth and to love those that are around us and to encourage the, the healing that needs to happen. You know, we need, to, we need to look at every single one of these circumstances that are either involving police or that are involving riots, and we need to look at these things, and we need to judge them rightly according to God's Word, not according to our skin color, and not according to the thinking of the world, but according to His Word. And that plays into number two. 
we must recognize the difference between partiality and discernment. Christians are called to this. You see the first statement that is there, and you can look on the screen or right in front of you. There's no blank here. I just want you to see it. In the Bible, partiality is favoritism based upon external appearances or characteristics that are not associated with the internal condition of the heart before God. That is partiality. It's being, imp excuse me, being impartial means you don't do that. You're impartial. You don't look at it. You, you, you don't look at the externals. Look at the next one here. In the Bible, discernment in spiritual matters is the ability to make proper distinctions on matters of the heart and life and practice, a.k.a., or also known as discretion, judgment, and wisdom. Christians, underline it, Christians need to develop good discernment that comes from God's truth, wisdom, and grace. So in all areas of life, God calls you to be discerning. The first and foremost area of being discerning is really not even listed here. It's, it's assumed. The, the big one is between right and wrong, truth and error. I mean, just in your life that you discern these things as being a child of God. But there are spe some specific things that we see in Scripture where Christians are called to make distinction, that they're called to be discerning. The first one is in the body of Christ or the church body. If you read the Bible, the, you see over and over and over again that God's people are called to distinguish between truth and error, right doctrine and wrong doctrine. That is a big deal to God. Letter B, biblically qualified elders and pastors. Not everybody can, can be a pastor. Not everybody should be a pastor. Not everybody is called to be a pastor. Not everybody is called to be an elder pastor. Elder is the same word as pastor. It's poimen, presbyteros, episkopos. Those are all used interchangeably for the role of a spiritual leader of the body of Christ. And there are, there are lists. Look at 1 Timothy and Titus 1. There are lists that say these need to be present. Same thing about deacons and care leaders in the life of the church. These things need to be present. The church is called to distinguish. You say, well, you, you, you mean not everybody can do that? No, no. The church is called to be careful about this. What about this one? This is an unlikely one. Letter D, true widows in need. This was in a time when there was no social security. This was in a time when the government wasn't involved with this. And, I mean, with the, the Jew, early church, it was, you need to take care of the widows. But not everybody's just a widow. Just because her husband died doesn't mean that she's in need. And so there's, there's quite a few verses on discerning is should she be on the list or should she not be on the list as getting the special care that is needed? You say, well, wouldn't it just immediately be all of it? Well, you, you, you would just recognize, and it's hard for us to see it because we don't see that level of poverty in America most of the time. And we have a governmental system of social security, but, but when you look at the biblical environment, there was a call for distinction. What about teachers? This is a big E, letter E. All through, I mean, there's many other passages besides the ones I've listed here. That, that you have to have teachers that are going to honor the truth. Letter F, mature versus immature. Letter G, moral versus immoral. Letter H, spiritual versus fleshly. You see, we are called to distinction. We are called to be discerning about what is right and what is wrong. What does God's word say in these things? So it's in the church body, but also, and this is a really big one for us this morning, number two, we are called to distinguish in the area of, just put in there, my own heart. You are called to distinguish in the area of your own heart, to discern. Letter A, am I a Christian? I'm a pastor, 
and I ask myself that question. It's not doubting my salvation to ask myself that question. You see, I go to what God's Word says about what a Christian is, and I compare my life to what His Word says that He says, come, receive me, and live for me. Filling out a card when you were eight years old doesn't automatically make you a Christian. Even being baptized doesn't automatically make you a Christian. You can deceive yourself. And I'm just telling you that on a continual basis, we must examine ourselves, and that is exactly what 2 Corinthians 13 says. Look what it says right there. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. That's what James is doing. Can't you see for yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless you actually fail the test? We need to test ourselves. Some of you today, I'm, I'm going to invite you to pray and receive Christ. Because maybe you would say, no, I know that as we've been listening to the word, as we've been studying, I, I know that my heart has not been surrendered to Christ. Well, do that today. Look at letter B. In our own heart, we need to ask the question, am I walking in sin? Am I walking in sin? And I, I just want you to see these words because these words um, are so important. They come to us as we come to the Lord's table. Um, and it's, it's Paul calling the church as they come to the Lord's table to do so carefully. Look at verse 27. 1 Corinthians 11 says, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat the bread and drink the cup. For if anyone who eats and drinks without discerning, there's that word, discerning, the body, discerning his own sin, eats and drinks what? Judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. You see, this is in the early church. And let me tell you that God was moving in very powerful ways, just like he is today. But there were some very evident things that God was wanting the early church to understand. And some of them would just flagrantly come in to the Lord's Supper. It had become just a big social event. And they would even, some people would come and they, they wouldn't even wait on others to get there. They weren't really remembering the death of the Lord. And they were coming without confessing their sin as the reason for his death and trusting in him. And some of God, God killed some of them for that. God sent the message like Ananias and Sapphira. You say that you did this to look spiritual and to look good, bam, you're dead. Verse 30, that's why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. Verse 31, but if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. And so we come and we confess to the Lord our sins. We judge rightly and listen we forsake those sins. That means we turn and walk away from them. Let her see. Am I walking in brokenness to Christ and God's will? Am I walking in brokenness to Christ and God's will? Because see, if you're broken in Christ, then you're healed in life. You find all the healing you need in Christ. He comes, and, and as we just bring to him our sin, as we bring to him our trouble, as we bring to him even the hurts and the injuries that we have received, and we walk in faith that he is the one who will truly wipe away every tear. 
He is the one that we say, death, where's your victory? Where's your sting? Death has been swallowed up in victory in Christ. We walk in brokenness. Look at Luke chapter 9, verse 23. And he said to all, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross, circle it daily, and follow me. We come to that place of being broken daily. Put out there to the side, living in repentance. Living in repentance. Our church staff knows that nobody on the staff needs to live in repentance more than me. I mean, they can tell you all about it. I, I, I have to just live in repentance. Marcy can tell you. I have to just live in brokenness before God. That is my only hope that we live broken to him. And I'm ashamed of the times when I don't. But that struggle and keeping coming back to Christ in faith is what tells me, yes, you're, you're his. Because when we stop coming back, when we stop being broken, when we stop seeking him, then it may indicate that we were never his. That's 1 John chapter 2. So what do we do? May we lay down ungodly partiality and take up godly discernment. May we lay down ungodly partiality and take up godly discernment.